So what I was trying to say is that the only church split I've ever seen was um, it, it was actually it was a time I got involved right after some stuff happened. So half the church wanted to forgive the moral failings of their previous pastor and bring him back. And the other half was like, we already have a new pastor now, so let's just stick with who we have. So, again, it was like a personality thing as far as that split goes. Um, and, and, you know, we hear a lot about the other partisan stuff to get involved, struggling churches struggle with that. Um Christian, Elizabeth, did either of y'all have anything you wanted to add as far as like what are some of the most prevalent things you've seen in like church splits or um, um yeah. So as I was saying, my my church is very blessed. Our pa- we're about to celebrate our pastor's 40th um year being lead pastor over the church, and he grew the church from like 50 people to now we have like nine, ten locations, over four thousand people average. And so within that 40 years, there's been a lot of opportunities, I guess you could say, for a church split. Of course, we've had many people transition out, but we've we've haven't gone anywhere near like a actual church split. And it could be because since we always launch campuses, people have a natural out to if they are upset with the Somerville campus, they can try the Goose Creek campus or they can try the Monk's Corner campus. And we have we call them campus hoppers. We do have like some people who do that. So I think that kind of, I don't want to say guard rails us of a church split, but the main Uh reason of a church split is you have division. And even though we have multiple campuses, our campus pastor, our lead pastor, Pastor Larry, he has always done so well with communicating vision, and this is faith, and this is why we do what we do. And he leads with transparency and open communication. Um, and he does it so well. So like I said, we're very blessed. Um, a lot of campus pastors were not happy with his big decision this Sunday, but they honored the leadership. We had a just a table. We didn't announce it. We didn't do anything big. But our lead pastor is very passionate, and he thinks voting is your civic privilege. It is a privilege um, being a citizen of the United States. He didn't push it on anyone. But in case anyone was unregistered to vote, we had a table open. They can sign up to vote. And so some people did not love it. Some people mm. did. And so that was a big, not really, I wouldn't say division, but it was a preference. And I think that's mm. the biggest thing. People want to die on their preference instead of just. Yeah. I mean, it's still a dispute. That's fair. Yeah. I ironically, um, when I was at Assemblies of God in Florida, my pastor was also Pastor Leary. And then I went to South Carolina and got Pastor Gary. Not a confusing at all for a kid. <laughs> Christian, do you have anything you wanted to add to this segment before we get to um, TJ's favorite part of this, I think? From personal experience, what I've seen caused the most problems inside of a church preventing unity within is pride of leadership, more often than not leadership, sometimes in the congregation. I'll, I'll put, throw that out there, too. Uh, a lack of self-awareness for people in charge and a lack of accountability for people in charge. Not every church I've been to has had those problems. I may have had one, may have had none, but there are certain ones I can think of where the deacons just felt like they were people who existed in the church and they had no say, and they would never think to overrule a decision. And I've had other churches where the deacons thought that they were God almighty himself and they would throw and do everything against what the pastor would say. And I've had pastors who would not step out to think that, hey, maybe my opinion isn't the only thing that matters. Maybe I need other people who will challenge me and work alongside me through challenging me. So I'll just throw that out there. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, bad stuff, but no, bad good stuff, content. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. One thing y'all know we like to do on the round table is the round table roundup, not sponsored. Uh, I'm going to read out four questions so everyone knows what they are, and then I'm going to go back one at a time, and each of you can answer one and only one of the four questions. You must repeat the question you are answering. No one can respond or ask any follow-up questions until after the roundup is complete. Some questions might not get answered. If we all choose to answer the same question, that sucks, and we're dumb. Uh, Josh and I will be participating. The questions are as follows. A. 
Are arguments about thermostats and carpet and the like as prevalent as some people make it seem? B. How do our local disputes impact our ability to witness to others outside of our church? C. Do churches with a more hierarchical structure have less local disputes than more self-governed churches? Or D. How does our liturgy play a part in the existence or absence of local disputes in the church? Who wants to go first? And what would you like to answer? Yeah, Christian. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, I'll do I'll do B. How do our local disputes impact our ability to witness to others outside of our church? Uh, once again, from personal experience, poorly. I- extremely poorly. As in uh, <laughs> attempting well to reach out to people, invite them, and then being, wait, you mean that church? Then you guys have this issue right here, and me not knowing that our dirty laundry is exposed to the entire city uh, that non-believers know what's going on in the church that's how bad it was that's how people were Mm. how much people were gossiping about the issue Mm. and it was affecting people leaving it was affecting people wanting to come and I i gotta say it took a lot of work to get things back on track that wouldn't have existed had we just Mm dealt with the problem at the source rather than letting it spread out Mm. yeah all right uh josh you're saying a lot of things do you want to go i just you know i just felt like he needed some noises of affirmation but i I can go yeah that's a spiritual gift yeah 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 that makes you next words of affirmation noises of affirmation is my spiritual (laughs) gift when i do word it starts messing it all up i shut up um (laughs) Uh, I'm going to answer um, how does our liturgy play a part in the existence or absence of local disputes in the church? Um, I actually think it can be rather important. I don't have any facts backing this up, mind you, um, other than just reading books by Caitlin Shess. She's awesome. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I do think that there's this sense when you're when you add liturgical practices to your church it kind of forces you to change your focus. You know, you can't, if you have like good liturgy and you're doing like the apostles creed, every service, you can't just focus on your local church. You are forced to think outside of that to the history of the church, to what the church has been before you've been here to all of the other churches that are saying the same creed. You know, um, my church, we are part of the, you know, ELCA. They have, you know, prayers that we're going to read. And that's, you know, when we're reading this, it focus, forces me to focus on everyone else in this congregation is saying the same prayer, caring about the same thing, thinking about these same issues. And so are the other people in other churches also reading this and thinking about it. So I think our liturgical practices can force us to focus on other things. Um, whereas if all you have in the service, in my opinion, if all you're doing is worship and a sermon, sometimes it's really easy to almost sit there as someone who is critiquing or only there as like an audience member as opposed to someone who's participating um so so i think that can affect things again nothing to back it up other than just you know caitlin chess said it and she's cool she is cool that's all um elizabeth pangalang and claude uh which round of question would you like to answer today i am going to do do churches with a more higher i can't speak with today here say that word for me here hierarchical Hier- hierarchical. Hierarchical. I can't say it. We don't, I knew it. we don't want heretical. I know, I, I know. I can't say it. Um, I tend to skip the second C because it just, it doesn't it, sound weird and it rolls I knew off it, looking better. at it, it was, I knew it in my head. I just, my tongue was not, you know. I also speaking. skipped the second C, but I, I never realized that anyway, I did that. So I'm doing that one. Structure have less disputes um, more than self governed churches. So do you mean by this, like within like the Assemblies of God network, you want me to answer answer or my faith church, how we have like a lead campus answer? Which Assemblies of God. Go with? Okay. Um, more like how do, does it, do you think in general churches that have to answer to some other thing other than just themselves have more or less disputes, I guess is the question. 
I I feel like they have less disputes um, because now they they almost have like a rule book and a guideline to follow. So to be a part of an Assemblies of God church, we have our doctrine and this is what we believe. This is the protocol if something happens. Same thing with our faith campuses. If you choose to campus pastor a faith campus, this is what it means to be a faith campus. And so it has a lot of less, um, less arguments because you know what you're signing up for versus if you are self-governing, like what stops a pastor from literally just speaking heresy because he has no accountability. And so then you have people in the church who, you know, wants to call out his heresy or people who is like, no, let them speak. And, you know, so there's just no structure and accountability, not all the time, but a lot of time with self-governed churches. All right. Nathan Gilmore. My friend. All right, I'll take a swing at A. Uh, our arguments about thermostats and carpet and the like as prevalent as some people make it seem. My sense is that those are often, uh, kind of like I was talking about before, uh, events that uh, become the story when really they are um, a decorative layer on top of the real story. So I'm sure that people argue about thermostats and carpet and such. Uh, I'm also confident uh, that if you dug down even just a little bit, you'd find out that there's a matter of teaching, there's a matter of partisan affiliation, there's a matter of personality conflict. There was something that uh, actually has the requisite force to split a church lurking somewhere beneath the surface. Uh, I think when people tell their stories about you know the church that split over the doorknob, sorry, Josh, uh, that probably the doorknob was not the thing wherein they caught the conscience of the king. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've seen some ugly doorknobs, though. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I am also going to... I'm serious. I am going to go with uh, B, probably. I'll double up with Christian. Uh, how do our local disputes impact our ability to witness to others outside of our church? The goal of the church is to serve the community uh, as the house of God. A house divided against itself cannot stand. A great man said that once. Mm, it was TJ. It and was he me. was there alive to witness it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you I, knew I really Abraham think... Lincoln. Yeah. yeah cool much dude. like the immortal, he was Abraham Lincoln. I, uh, I, yeah. I love Invincible, but no, me and uh, me and Abe wrestled together. But uh, so basically, uh, I think that speaks for itself. How can you possibly go out and witness to the people and fulfill your mission if you're too busy trying to gut each other over who's bringing the baked spaghetti every Wednesday night? They need to use more Parmesan and less cheddar. Cheddar good, though. Yeah. So now that uh, we've all rounded up the round table, did anybody have anything to add uh, or that they would like to respond to now that the roundup is complete. Yes. <laughs> Ipped. Um, all, all I have for you and Christian is an amen. Um, <laughs> El Elizabeth said something. I knew actually it was going to come to me. That, no, I, I liked it. It, it, it's a, oh, it's a good thing. It was, it was a positive. Wow. Um, well, you're talking about like the accountability and how maybe less disputes happen because people aren't calling out the pastor, which was, was interesting because it's like a, Oh yeah, that's right. Some disputes, some splits can be good. <laughs> Splitting from heresy is a good thing. <laughs> it's not something we think about a lot on our, on your favorite church unity podcast, but sometimes unity ain't the answer. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the thing I wanted to respond to that, uh, that Nathan said, um, I was hoping that I would remember. I'm so bad at remembering <laughs> things. Um, no, no, I, I, I'm with you. I, I think. Oh, okay. I remember now. I, I think too. A lot of it is people who work behind the scenes sometimes blow issues up, and it's like no one ever really split over the thermostat. But the amount of times you hear people who work in church complain about people complaining about thermostats is a lot, <laughs> because what happens is. You hear, if you're working in church, a lot of times, you know, you hear all these medical emergencies, all these things that like people sold someone out on drugs, all these like crazy stuff. And then little old whoever, Betsy, wants to come up and 
I just can't believe you would keep the church so cold. And it's like, for her, it's a legitimate concern. And I actually do think, hey, that stuff matters. Also, if you keep the church too cold, you're sweater. using too much power. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. you know, but yeah, so it's not sweater. that her thing doesn't matter at all. Like, if it's uncomfortable, someone should say something. It doesn't have to be a full complaint, but say something. But when you've heard all these other big complaints and then someone, no matter what their reasoning or heart is in the issue, bring something like that up. Man, is it frustrating because you're like, who cares? <laughs> Literally, someone down the road is in the hospital I have to get to. Who cares that it was a little too cold? But also, my, people do care. My favorite um, my favorite ever, we were doing portable church, and so we always had a tent set up for like, you know, the guest area because um, it was hard to find space. And I was in charge of like the volunteers making sure all the foyer, the front was set up. And I was like, hey, it's not raining today. Let's put up that tent, guys. We're, we're going to be welcoming. We're going to uh, volunteer. She was older. She's like, we're not doing the tent today. I'm like, oh, why are we not doing the tent today? It's It's beautiful. She said the air was too damp. And and I will tell the story so till the day I die as one of the funniest like church encounters I've had. So I think like also you say, you know, we blow it out of a proportion, but it's more like it's just it's funny. Yeah, Look, sometimes. We, we sometimes laugh so we don't funny. cry. Being humid in a tent <laughs> is pretty awful. Gotta hand it to her. <laughs> there was at least once that TJ and I had to share a tent and it was just so bad that it was we, a um, pop up. We went tent. to a dock. We literally there was slept no on a dock. Closure. <laughs> Still. Yeah, no. It was like for two hours it. on a Sunday morning on the beautiful day. <laughs> and plus, we're in the South. We live in humidity. The air yeah, is sucks. always too damp. <laughs> nah. Always. I love humidity, but not that one day. That one day was too much. <laughs> Nathan really wanted to say something earlier. Sorry, Nathan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I wanted you. to follow up on what uh, Josh said about <laughs> liturgy, because I think that in our moment right now in particular, I think there's a, a special place for a more structured liturgy. Uh, precisely because it militates against, it puts a barrier between a congregation and the kind of special services that, you know, you hear so often, you know, drive off droves of people. Uh, so, I mean, you know, if if you begin with a confession of sins and then you go into prayers and then you hear the word read and then you hear the word preached and then, you know, so on and so forth, uh, there's a lot less time for the, you know, um, pick your partisan poison here, special service, you know, where we dedicate ourselves mm -hmm. to signaling our, you know, fealty to one or other of the political parties. And I had to phrase that very carefully so that, you know, both parties could be offended equally. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I really want to go wise. to the church that's like biased towards the independence party or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're just nice. Where's the yellow loose. <laughs> Exclusively Green Party at this church. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Where's the they Jill still Stein the church? No, nothings in the wigs. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but <laughs> back to it just a moment. I mean, I, you know, if there is a lectionary text, just for instance, right? If there is a set calendar of readings and the sermon is about that calendar of readings, it gets a lot harder to harp on, you know, whatever you heard on AM radio, MSNBC, or whatever your favorite partisan medium is that week because you have to go with the text that comes in front of you. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that's one of those things. I mean, I, um, you know, of course I teach a lot of sonnets, so this is always my go-to example, but you yeah. know, uh, if you have to write 14 lines in a certain meter and a certain rhyme scheme, uh, you have to have a pretty, you know, impressive skill set to actually make that work and actually make it original. I think the same thing goes when you're working within a more structured liturgy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing lets you flex your creativity like a limitation. It's true, though. Yeah, that's why I said it. Uh, <laughs> Sounds so, funny, though. So how do we address these issues or prevent them from getting in the way of unity? Do we have to just accept these kind of fights as something that's going to happen at this side of heaven? Communication. Communication. Uh, can we work to better ourselves in this area? Especially with transitions happening, a lot of people, they they want to know why. And they may not deserve to know the why because you're in leadership and you have a different perspective. But just communicating to them. And if they understand the why we're doing something, if they still have a problem with it, this is how we do it. 
we're not making you stay. We want, we would love to have a place for you here. We do have a place for you here, but this is the why we do it. And if you're not on board with our why, we can't, we can't help you because this is who we are. Yeah. Yeah. I think clarity from the leadership can also help. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I maintain that even if you're not going to do a liturgical, like lectionary that you're going to be preaching the same thing week after week, you know, based on it, I, I still think it's helpful to have stuff like, Hey, we're going to do the apostles creed at the end of service. And then before you do it, say, here's why we're doing this. We're doing this for the connection we feel to others to reaffirm what we do believe. What is first here? The important stuff, not all these other th issues. This is what's important. Or, Hey, when you do your worship, you know, good worship leaders like Elizabeth's husband, Taylor, shout out, will so good. say, here's why we're doing a song. Let me tell you about the song. What is the meaning of this? So it's not just something you're sitting there and enjoying as a show, but it's something you are participating in. So I think it's important. Clarity and participation, I think are very important parts of our church services that can help with this. Yeah. Do we have to accept these things? Yes, but not in a fatalistic sense. We just need to know people. And mm -hmm. a good part of leadership is knowing people, knowing how they're going to react to things and getting ahead of that and speaking with them. So, yeah, I highly agree with that idea. Another is, look, it, even with that going, at, it's going to happen. No matter how perfect your argument is structured. No, if you've got all the, the PowerPoint designs here, here's a 50 step plan. There's always going to be a, a faction or just someone who's going to disagree. And you're going to have to talk it out with them and eventually along the way, you're going to have to figure out, well, I don't think you're a good fit here. And, or if you're not accepting it, you can still be a part of this as long as you're not, you know, raising a stink about it. Like we can have disagreements over, you know, how we're structuring you know, the building itself or what color we're putting on there. But at the end of the day, like, I hate to lose you when you're in this ministry right here over something like that. Let's what, what, what can we find common ground on besides this issue? Yes. Right, right. Yeah. And and to tack on to what Christian said, I mean, you know, this is, I, I would say that the forces that are pulling people away from churches are far more intentional now than they were 20 years ago when I was a young believer. Um, and I say that because, I mean, you know, you, you can actually point to them in the wild, right? You know, this is not a hypothetical thing. There was a movement, you know, oh, I want to say six or seven years ago, but it might have been longer because I'm getting old. Uh, you know, called Leave Loud, right? And I mean, it was actively encouraging people to not only leave their churches, but also to post, you know, uh, copiously online about why they're leaving their churches, right? And then, I mean, you know, on the other side of the aisle, you know, you had television personalities saying that, you know, if your church uses this phrase, uh, you need to leave your church right now and find another one, right? Uh, so again, I mean, I, I know that I harp on this a lot when I'm on the whole church podcast, but I think that when we're talking about church unity in the decade that we're operating right now, I mean, you know, those are some of the forces that even if they're not the most powerful, they are the most deliberate in their, you know, desire to actually separate people from the communities with which they worship. Like I said mm -hmm. before, I mean, yeah. you know, um, very few people would uh, leave a political party because their church said so. But a lot mm -hmm. of people, and I know them personally, have left and are leaving churches because their political party told them to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's sad. Um, the the other thing, so uh, you know, that's one of the big ones we mentioned. The other big one we mentioned were people leaving basically because of personalities or because of the pastor, um, one way or the other. So for those who aren't the leaders of the church, for the regular people of the church, um, I'm gonna let Elizabeth answer this after. TJ, the, the king of brevity, um, I was kind of curious, what what do you think we could do as far as like, how do we maintain unity when we have strong feelings about the leader that maybe aren't positive or great? Well, it's a difficult thing to do, to put yourself aside. Uh, if you're not able to do that and you can talk to your leader, you can also leave that church. I know we don't want to do that. Yeah, we want to promote that's unity. That's not church unity. <laughs> but are you talking about? Oh, go ahead. I thought you were done. There's a lot of ways that that can get in the way, and if you're not able to set yourself aside to belong to the church that you love, then oh well. 
as the great warrior poet J. Cole once said, pride is the devil. I mean, yeah. Okay, Elizabeth. So were you asking if someone else is unhappy? How do we encourage them? Or if I myself and I'm unhappy? Well, can you describe the question a little bit more? Sure. Either of those. That works. Okay, so repeat the question now. I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> of course you don't. It was, um, <laughs> we're talking about currently the fact that we mentioned a lot of splits or disputes happen based on the personality of the leader. So just kind of dealing with that from as people who aren't leaders, how do we, it, you know, those who aren't leaders, how do they deal with that, I guess? I don't know. I mean, maybe third you, party is I could wait for you. I that. feel even though you're a leader, you always have to do a heart check yourself because you never want to purposely. But the non leaders are what we're talking about. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, that's what I'm saying. But okay, like, sorry. so I know someone who literally decided not to go to the church anymore because he didn't like how many shoe illustrations that one of the pastors had even though like shoe collecting was his hobby. And so you're talking about the non-leaders not trusting the leadership of the church. So what do you mean by non? Uh, they, they might have several reasons when it comes to the leader being the issue. I don't know. I, we I'm, mentioned I'm, a few. Christian, can you help explain Josh's question to me? Because he keeps on changing it. I, I'll do my best. It's like, of the many possible factors that exist for why a person could leave, how are we supposed to work alongside them in that regard? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Sorry. That's not close. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> you, but you close to what? Close to what? You don't even know you what you're even, asking you me, Josh. I want to answer you, the question. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> okay, how do we address those who are leaving or having disputes because of the personality of the leaders? Yes, because of the, so what, as I was saying, you have to kind of check the heart because if someone's leaving the church because they do not like how much the guy talks about his shoe collection, but he's still like his sermon is still biblical and stuff like that. That's just a preference. I can't address that because you can choose to sit under the personality of this pastor or not. If he's not speaking heresy, if he's doing what God has called him to do and he, they just don't like his illustration to like, you know, connect the word of God trying to the, his life, uh, you know, like a story as an example, what can you do? Like, so am I trying to get people to stay to the church? Because I never, I've never tried no. to get people to stay to church before. No, that I mean, it, it's it's brought up a lot of thoughts for me, all the random things that we all just said. <laughs> so I, I, I do think there are different kinds of answers to this, because if it's something where like the pastor is constantly bringing up um, one way or the other, does not matter what side he's bringing it up. But if he's bringing up LGBTQ issues every single service, I could see that being a legitimate cause for concern. Or, you know, if he's constantly talking about his wife in ways that you think is demeaning or not appropriate. Yeah. That would be uh, so that weird. Kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah no, like there they there are leave. like legitimate reasons. And then there's it, reasons of like the shoe example. I think that's a good one too. So I think first you got to ask what kind of reason is this? If it were the shoe and you just don't like examples, I think maybe put yourself aside like TJ was talking about, humble yourself, whatever. If it's something that's like the wife or something else that you're like, this is concerning. This would be my thought. I'm curious how y'all's response. Um, I don't think the pastor is above anybody else. We're all a priesthood of believers. I had to be really careful how I worded that because of our other podcast. <laughs> I almost said the wrong word. Um, but, you know, I, I think the Bible teaches that we all have authority in Christ, right? So I don't think that Jesus' words only apply to people who aren't pastors. I think that verse that we read at the beginning still would apply, that me and Christian could come together pull the pastor aside and say, Hey, listen, we know that you're talking about your wife this way. And we don't think it's really appropriate and correct him. And if he doesn't bring in more, and if not, let's have the church talk about it. That's perfectly fine. That's why I said in the beginning, like the pastor yeah. really has to check his heart to see if the, if he is above approach or not, because he's not, no one's above approach. But if you just don't like my example, because I said a funny story about my kid, but I'm talking about how I stumbled just like my kid and, you know, and God still picks me up every single time. Like that's 
that's my example. Like I didn't say anything biblically inaccurate. I didn't demean anyone. Um, we do get, we always have a, we always have, um, like we just did a series, Sex, Lies, and the Truth. And we do talk about our stances on certain sexualities and gender. And this is our stances. But once again, you know, we are an Assemblies of God church. This is what we believe. This is what we're sharing. And this is what we hold true. We're not shaming anyone. We're just holding our stance. So if you are uncomfortable with that, there is still a place for you here. But if this makes you uncomfortable, we're not going to change who we are for your comfort. We're not here yeah. for your comfort. We're here to tell you the truth about Jesus. Yeah. I honestly forgot that topic based preaching happens. I literally just forgot that that's a thing. My mind was more thinking of like, if you're going through the book of Mark and somehow every chapter and you, you relate back to that, that's an issue because <laughs> not every chapter is about that. Um, I, I, I will say too, there's a way to leave. Well, if this issue does become something you need to leave over that, doesn't break Christian unity in my mind. So let's say, for example, I've never been in this situation, but let's say Pastor Will, for some reason, has decided that from now on, his favorite sermon illustration is cars driving and stopping at stop signs. And for me, I have PTSD around this subject. So he uses that illustration every single Sunday. Eventually, I can't handle it anymore. Sorry, Pastor Will. I know you wouldn't do this. I love you. But that doesn't mean he has to change his preaching because of me. That means maybe I need a different preacher and that's okay. I can leave well, explain my reasonings, leave on good terms and still have unity with the church without having to go to that church specifically. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And some people do. So we've had people, they have been hurt with the church before and they almost come to us to heal for a little bit. And then they've come and like, hey, we feel like it's time to go back home to our church or hey, like, you know, we really enjoyed our time here, but now we're going to transition here. And that's great. Let us know, especially because if you are a regular attender and you're a volunteer and you just dip out, we're going to worry about you because we care about you. Yeah. Nathan, Christian, y'all have any any thoughts about uh, this side of the conversation of how we can maintain unity subjects about pastors and personality splits and disputes? <laughs> And I know Joshua. What was the original Vague question? Thing. Who knows? I'm glad Christian was as confused because I felt really like I was just not catching what you were asking. It's fine. And sometimes I just word vomit. I knew what he meant. Well, TJ, Thank why didn't you, you come to our rescue? <laughs> you didn't ask. Like, if that were me, if if I were the the pastor in that scenario, I would like to meet with this person. It's like, hey, like, what, what is it? What did I've done? Or what did I say? And then. You know, if there's nothing, if it, or if it was that example you gave earlier about the car and you came up to me and said, hey, I went through this horrific accident. I pretty much died. Every time you bring this up, all it does is it brings me back to this moment in time that I don't want to be in anymore. I've, I've worked as hard as I can to get past that. And you're making me relive that every time you do it. And then I don't respond with that makes sense. I can look after the one sheep here, even though the other 99 aren't affected by it. I can do that. But if the pastor doesn't do that and it's still bringing you to that point and making you relive those things that have hurt you, I'm fine with you leaving in that scenario. I wouldn't be fine if I was the pastor and I didn't listen to you, but I'd be fine with you going elsewhere because you're not being fed. You're not being cared for. You're not being tended to. And that's not loving. That's not what the pastor is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Also, while we're talking about times that's appropriate to split, and tying it back to Nathan's thing. <laughs> I do think it would be appropriate for you to go to a different church because the church you're at is talking about politics so much that it's become more a place of politics than a place of the word of God. I am not okay with you leaving because you just don't like the political positions of the leader. Those are two different things. In Unpopular my opinion. opinion. I don't think the political, I don't think the people should preach their political stance on the platform. Like I definitely think that's have a your... very popular opinion. Yeah, yes. but I'm I have just, to disagree I'm... because I'd see because here's the thing: you have so much power, and you your platform is to glorify God. Your platform is not to convince people who to vote for. That's that part's true. That's different. Convincing who to vote for and your political views are. are but you have to acknowledge that you are in a position of influence, and so people are going to automatically assume that who you're going to vote for is going to be the way. Yes, but the Bible has a lot to say about political views, so I don't think you can preach the Bible and avoid political views, unless you're just skipping a majority of the Bible. Yeah, it's not the topic. 
at hand. Yeah, yeah. I didn't say political yeah, views. You should have listened to the original you're question. You're voting your stance. You're voting stance. Yeah, that that's, that makes more sense. <laughs> but rhetorically, those two often get blended, right? So, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. um, and again, this is something that I've definitely uh, seen myself and also heard from friends who are in the ministry and also just any kind of really teaching position in the church uh, is that, you know, um, you know, Walter Brueggemann had a line um, in, in his book, Theology of the Old Testament. He said, uh, if you uh, read what the Old Testament has to say about sexuality and you think that you should take it seriously, Americans will call you conservative. If you read what the uh, Old Testament has to say about wealth and take it seriously, Americans will call you a communist. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah. yes. the fact of the matter <laughs> is that, I mean, you know, whether you intend to tell people how to vote or not, uh, intentions only matter a limited amount. Uh, what people perceive matters also. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That being said, if your pastor pulls up to your church with a big Joe Biden or MAGA flag on his truck, I, I, I think that's a reasonable thing to be concerned about. <laughs> Either way. I, I think it is. I also, I mean, I, I think also, I mean... How am I going to phrase this? I think that too often, uh, you know, when people say that I left because the preacher told me to vote this way or that way, uh, if you mm-hmm. tracked it down, and, and once again, I'm, I'm playing the amateur detective here, <laughs> but I, I have a hunch that if you tracked it down, there probably, if there was a direct reference to either political party, uh, it was probably a sliver of, you know, what was actually driving the person away. Odds are it was something that, and, you know, th- this is something I spend a lot of talk- time talking about, Josh, and this is why I'm kind of fumbling with it, because I'm still trying mm-hmm. to formulate what I think about it. But I think that, you know, one of the things that people leave churches for is if it doesn't confirm what they already came wanting to think, especially mm-hmm. in matters of culture, especially in matters of society, especially in matters of politics. And, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, if someone calls into question what I would call idolatry or what I would call, uh, you know, a, a lack of faith, uh, frankly, uh, Mm -hmm. I think that some people, because so much of our current conversation, public conversation is coded as partisan loyalty. They will hear, even if the other person did not say you should not vote for the person that you voted for two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man, Real this quick, might be. If there were a series called Nathan Gilmore Church Detective, I'm there day one. <laughs> That's a podcast I want to listen to. I got to tell you. <laughs> um, no, I. So uh, I think we're going to save this for our next roundtable talk. But to, to tease it a little bit, I have heard a pastor from the pulpit say, one party wants to kill your babies. And that is not an okay thing for a pastor to say. Because you're talking about a party and you're being really specific there. And I'm just like, hmm, that's not that's not what's happening, first of all. And second of all, you're just telling people how to vote at that point. That's not okay. Um, I've also talked to a pastor, you know, just one-on-one. Um, I don't know if it was confidential or not, so I'm not going to say names or anything. But who who told me he will not preach Daniel or Isaiah because it's too political. And to be afraid to talk about two whole books of the Bible, that's sad. That is also wrong. <laughs> So, ouch. Yeah. Dash Come back next time. on the rocks. <laughs> Man, they will yeah, never know fine. what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> yeah, and they can never debate Joshua about the historicity of Jan- Daniel. Dang. That's just a mean Christian thing. That's what we do in our free time. <laughs> we just talk about Daniel back and forth. You should see our text messages. It's exclusively reference. Yep. I even have like, like I do like the, parenth- the parenthetical um, citations, and I'm like, well, See, if you see here, the literary structure actually, according to parentheses Lucas, um, it, it's great text. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so we TJ, do have free time. Play for me here. Okay, guys, one thing we like to do, and you all know we like to do this, um, we like to talk about, there it is. <sighs> Sorry. We like to ask everybody before we wrap up, what a tangible, practical way that we can maintain unity is. So if someone is at a church right now and there's some kind of local dispute over one of the things we said, whether it be about the pastor or whether it be about politics or anything else, if there's something that there is causing some kind of dispute in their church about what should they do right now that could help address that? Nathan, I'll let you go first. 
Sure. I think one thing that, uh, especially those of us who teach and those of us who preach in churches, can really push the unity passages and really point them towards, and I know this is exactly the opposite of what we just said we should do, but point them towards Christ as ultimate and political parties as at most secondary and probably intermediary and probably less than intermediate. Yeah, okay? less than tertiary. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, le- le- less than tertiary. I like yeah. that. There's, we there's love a name a ordinary of the issue. podcast, right? Uh, <laughs> but I think that, you know, that's something that, you know, I've tried to push, especially, I mean, you know, as partisan media has become more and more the daily consumption of more and more people. Uh, because, I mean, it is a pressure that I think needs to be resisted intentionally and deliberately and not left to, well, I hope they're not thinking that way. Yeah. Christian, regardless of what the disputes are, if someone's at a church where they're currently having these kind of disputes and arguments, what would you say something practical they can do right now to help the situation? Uh, In that scenario, I'd ask myself, what are my limits? How far am I willing to go to maintain unity, to maintain friendships, to uh, maintain whatever position I'm at at the church or whoever's at the church and then ask that person that same question. Like how far are they willing to go? Like you're not the only person who has to do work here in this scenario. There's more than one person involved. And if their limitations aren't anywhere close to yours or uh, their scenarios aren't anywhere close to yours, then as sad as I am to say it, it might be time to leave. TJ, regardless of what the disputes are, what's the thing they can do right now? To help address disputes if there are any in their local church so it's hard to what's the word i'm trying to like, produce the tangibility of the idea is usually what's hard to come up with for these something you can actually do like immediately uh, but take the issue you're having and ask someone else if they feel the same way someone you trust see see how they feel about the issue if it's just you, just talk to the person that's causing the issue. Yeah. Elizabeth, same question. So my first um, thought would be like, man, show gratitude. And that sounds really weird, but I'm so... I feel like gratitude is such a powerful thing whenever I'm feeling down or I feel like I'm upset with someone, me personally. If I start thanking God for what they've done in my life or I just start thanking God for like their presence. Number one, that puts my eyes off of their, that situation. So I calm down a little bit and it kind of realigns my focus. But also if you're going to go to someone with a problem and if you kind of like seek a little bit of gratitude or just kind of like have that like little separation from it, you're going to go with a different heart. And then no one likes it, especially a manager, If you just come and you bring a problem, you know, say, hey, I'm really thankful you did this. I'm thankful for your friendship. I'm thankful for your voice in my life. I'm thankful that you serve in X, Y, and Z. I do want to bring this up as an area of concern because it's not just showing like, hey, I think you suck and I want to fix it. It's like, I see your worth. I see your value and I want to help you grow. So I feel like just kind of bringing in that different perspective and bringing forth a dispute will help it a lot. Yeah, I'm actually going to answer this too. Usually it's not just you and one other person that's the disputes in your church. If it is, this is a lot easier to do. Um, Usually I know there's a lot of people involved and you're probably able to identify a couple people who are really passionate, one side or the other. And the people who are really affected by whatever the dispute is, whatever the arguments are, are, or things they don't like are, think about these people, make a small list, make just five people, maybe write their names down, pray for them, text them, and just tell them you love them and that you're praying for them. You don't even need to, the the issue is going to come back up. It's going to. Sometimes it's okay to take a break from the issue, from the struggle, and just let people know that you care about them and that you're praying for them. Um, And I think that might be the most, I actually do. I think prayer in general, I always think is the most important thing to to focus on. So Mm -hmm. that's where I'm going to go. Mm-hmm. I will go to war and die if somebody tries to change my church's Viridian carpet. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> TJ is the 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 issue that we're all here to talk about. I, you guys thought I was joking about the round table gathering for him. 
Yeah. <laughs> Smite me if you dare. <laughs> so, what would the repercussions be in the world around us if everyone started doing everything we just said? It's a lot to say. I think we'd have a lot less people leaving churches. Or a lot more people leaving churches. It just depends on which part of what I said you listen to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, just like everything we said here involves like, you know, if we're doing all this, we're addressing the issue, we're bringing it up, but we're doing it with gratitude or prayerfully doing it. We're caring about the other, we're loving them. Um, I think people would feel more loved. And Jesus did say that's how people would know his people. So I think I would also make us better witnesses in the world. Call back to Christian's answer during the roundtable segment. Yeah, I think it would be a lot harder for us to be angry, a lot harder for us to hate that person if we approach it the way that we've suggested here today. And yeah, things happen. Knee-jerk reaction is anger, sometimes even righteous anger. That doesn't always remain my heart doesn't always remain consistent. Mm -hmm. So taking the time to step away and be presentable, you know, be gracious about what they've done. It's a lot harder for you to end up in a full on argument in that yeah. scenario. Not impossible, but a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this isn't someone, every something everyone needs to answer, but if you feel like it, you can before we move on. All right. So, uh, before we wrap up, we'd like to ask everyone to share a moment where they saw God recently. We call that our God moment. A little clever play on words there. Um, whether it be a blessing, challenge, moment of worship, whatever it may be, I always make Joshua go first because it gives the rest of us enough time to think if you were unprepared for this moment. Yeah, yeah I have a small story, so that, that'll help everyone have time to think. Um, I won't say where because I don't know if I'm legally able to. But I, I was somewhere that had produce um, and, <laughs> and discovered a caterpillar, a very tiny caterpillar that at this point has gone through chemical washes and been in a refrigerated truck and traveled who knows how far and all this. You're talking about and Chipotle? Somehow it was alive. They don't wash the I lettuce. I cannot answer all. that question. Yes, Do I? Can. That's normal. For, yeah. That's I know it's you normal, but... Lettuce. Yeah, I know, but yeah, they, I know it's normal. They take it out of the dirt and put it in the box. Yes, but, you know, again, we're not allowed to mention Chipotle on social media. It was media. an arduous journey. There is a legal way. thing where we're signed, agreeing not to mention on social media. So, you know, I don't I don't know if that applies to podcast or not. I don't think so. I don't want to be a criminal. Anyway, <laughs> there's a caterpillar. It survived somehow. For those of you who follow this podcast for any time at all, know that I have a pollinator garden at home. So naturally, I put this little tiny caterpillar that survived all this crazy stuff into a little cub, brought it all the way home, where I actually looked like I took a picture, did that little Google lens thing, figured out what kind of caterpillar he was. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I have a host plant for him that he can eat and survive solely on this plant. So I brought him to my house, put him on the little plant, uh, watched him for a while and just appreciated, hey, he's eating, he's living, and then thought about... Um, that whole verse where Jesus says, hey, if I will feed the sparrows, how much more do I care about you? I was like, man, if I am capable of this much care and attention for a tiny caterpillar less than the size of my pinky nail, how much more does God care about me? And it was just nice. It was a good thought. Mm. Yeah, we yeah. had a ladybug in ours the other day. I love when those happen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I will go next out of kindness. Uh, but I've been seeing a lot of people, a lot of really young people that I know get really active, uh, in protesting for pre Palestine, which whatever side of the coin you land on, I don't really care. That's your business. Uh, but it's so cool to see young people be active politically. That's awesome. And they go hard. Like they're not playing around. They're willing to get, you know, beat. as long as it's peaceful. It's awesome. <laughs> No, I support any kind of protest. All right. It's our constitutional right. I, no, it's still it illegal a lot of the time. <laughs> a lot of the time. Anyway, that's my God moment. 
I love to see active young people. I like how much we're flirting with the law during our God moments today. <laughs> it's great. Christian, what's your legally questionable God moment? <laughs> Nothing legally questionable here. So like I mentioned right, last time on, I then. was on and earlier today, uh, I did join a new church and I'm looking for places to serve. And our church happens to be one that was at one point in time really wealthy and has a larger facility than other churches. But the membership has dwindled a little bit, but pre-COVID we had uh, a functioning gym and a skating rink and bowling alley and stuff like that that have been in the bit of disrepair. And I just had a meeting with the pastor yesterday, uh, excuse me, Wednesday uh, about working together and seeing if we could restart those programs that were happening pre-COVID. And the response was very positive. He was uh, enthralled by my enthusiasm and the enthusiasm of someone else that might be working alongside me. So I was really happy to see that those facilities could see some use. We could get back into the community again and reach out to people. And I'm really hyped on that. But since this is me talking and I always cheat, uh, my second one is I was kind of having a little bit of down day the other day and I was just uh, talking with my mom and she texted me. She forwarded me a video of my niece just playing and saying mama. And that just meant the mm. world to me to, you know, just talking about her, just talking about my sister-in-law in that way. Like she's uh, almost a year old now. And as a special bonus to the YouTube viewers, I have the lovely Aww. picture of Adorable. my girl, Malin. Cute. And yeah, that the light of my life, love her to death. It just feels good to have her in my life. Good stuff. Um, mine is kind of a a God moment, as in I had to put my trust in God because I officially resigned from my job. I will not be teaching next year. So in three weeks, three and a half, four weeks, I will be jobless with nothing lined up. But I know it was my, my season has ended with the school district and we don't know what we're going to do. But yeah, yeah, I mean, but just trusting God, even in the, in the quietness, he's still there. That can definitely be a challenge. All right. Bring us home, Nathan Gilmore. Yeah, mine is also involved with uh, school districts. But uh, on the other end of things, uh, you know, as I was telling folks uh, before we started recording, you know, uh, last calendar year, uh, you know, a college teaching career that took up algebraically half of my life on this planet uh, came to a crashing end. Uh, it was sudden, it was ugly, and it was not my fault. Uh, but, you know, I'm getting up to the uh, finals week of my first year uh, teaching high school. So uh, it, I'm not good at it. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I still have a long way to go uh, when it comes to, you know, teaching in this new context. But um, I have survived, and I know that uh, – you know, a lot of my friends who have left academia have ended up a lot worse than I have. So, you know, I'm certainly thankful that I've landed, uh, it, you know, I, I might've lost my landing gear, but, uh, you know, yeah, go where you will with the airplane metaphor. I lost Bloods it. Bloods and rivers right there. <laughs> Man. <laughs> We're throwing mm. it back to Sully for that one. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, Please share the episode with a friend, share with an enemy, a cousin, um, any other, uh, you know, adversaries you might have, any other people in your life, aunts, uncles. I count those as cousins for the purpose of saying it, but I thought you were <laughs> counting them as adversaries. <laughs> it depends. Yeah, it definitely depends. Uh, but. Uh, get the merch on our store to support the show. We just fixed the link. There's some cool stuff on the way. Uh they, we are making socks with my face on them for some reason. <laughs> yes. What is more church unity than TJ's face? Yeah. Just a great unifier. They call me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Also, guys, be sure you check out the other shows on the Amazon Ministry Podcast and Network. Christian has one on there. Let Nothing Move You. It's fantastic. He's getting ready to wrap up Genesis. So, hey, check out the whole network. There's one feed on uh, Spotify, and you can find the network on Apple Podcasts and see what all other shows are on there. 
Yeah, it's pretty cool. We hope you enjoyed it. Convenient. Next week, we're going to have Michelle Lazaric, author of Raising Kids to Follow Christ. After that, we'll be doing an episode with Will Rose of Systematic Ecology fame, also was here today. Ryan Doe's of the Mini Paths Podcast Network and Nick Polk of the Tolkien Heads, formerly of Systematic Ecology fame, to discuss our involvement in this year's Theology Beer Camp 2024 in Denver, Colorado. Our code is Holeshire, that is W H O L E S H I R E. For anyone interested wow. and looking you know for how to a spell so much better than me. Yeah, I know how to read. <laughs> uh, looking for a discount to the event, and we will have on Pastor Leslie Schoenfield to discuss her journey as the first ordained woman in her church and her work on generational unity. And at the end of season one, Francis Chan. Whoa, he he still doesn't know. I just cut to the punch. He doesn't know, guys. I'm sorry. None of Completely you told him. It is on you. It's your fault. But he doesn't know. Yeah, he will be. He, yeah, he is slow bros hidden ability. Unaware. Mm, yeah. <laughs>